Thank you very much for that, Joel. There is a number of questions, I think, come from that presentation. Our next speaker is Dr Liam Whitmore uh, of the North Wales Rivers Trust. He is the lead restoration officer. Liam has extensive experience in field work spanning the UK waters and international settings. He's currently spearheading oops, an ambitious project aimed at mitigating nutrient loss and reducing phosphorus loads and entering the, the fluid catchment through his innovative nature-based solutions. His presentation will focus on the Avonbach project. Uh, hi everyone, I'm not used to a microphone. Um, I'm Liam, so I'm part of the river restoration team for the North Wales Rivers Trust. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about environmental DNA, um, what it's good for, and with particular emphasis on a case study that we've done in a catchment on the Cluid um, called the Avonbach. So I just outlined my uh, presentation. So I'm just going to cover a bit of my background, sort of why I'm qualified to to talk to you about all of this um, and then we're going to go straight into what is environmental DNA, what it's used for, some of its pros and cons and then we're going to cover that case study and why you should consider incorporating it into your species monitoring. So a bit of background about me, so as fresh face, some other people might have other words that come to mind but that's me at 21 at Bangor University sort of getting my foundational knowledge. And then once I completed my course at Bangor, I moved on to my PhD um, studying sea turtles in uh, Florida, which was a really cool uh, PhD to do. And we studied a particular uh, cancerous disease that they have called fibropapillomatosis, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, and obviously these are endangered and elusive species. So we had to sort of utilize novel techniques to study these animals because they're quite hard to get hold of. <laughs> and then uh, January last year, I sort of after fin I finished my PhD and in January last year I joined the North Wales Rivers Trust and obviously with all of my skills in environmental DNA wanted to, that, to bring that along with me as well. So what is environmental DNA? So all animals who move through and interact with their environment leave traces or fragments of DNA behind and that can be uh, in the source of fur, hair, urine, faeces, saliva, skin, anything like that will leave DNA behind in the environment. And it can be collected from almost any environment, but it especially works well in uh, uh, freshwater or obviously the marine environment as well. So what the process of environmental DNA and studying it is basically we collect those fragments of DNA from uh, the original source, and then we extract the DNA and analyze it to detect species in those samples. And it's a really non-invasive technique um, to study biodiversity. So in an animal context, what is environmental DNA used for? So it's a perfect tool for studying endangered or elusive or invasive species. Uh, it's great for the species which are hard to access, so those in water. Um, it's much less invasive compared to other traditional methods. Uh, and it's particularly powerful in rivers as all water flows in a single direction. So you can really make it a targetable approach at where you want to look at as well. And then on the flip side of that, environmental DNA is actually really good for pathogen surveillance um, for both human and animal pathogens. Um, and it's particularly relevant to human health as obviously all rivers are vectors for human waste water. Um, therefore, it can be developed as a, a sort of great early detection or early warning sign for potential pathogen outbreaks. And I like to use COVID-19 for this as an example, because this is where this field really excelled. Um, so studies across all of, sort of Europe and globally were able to detect peak concentrations of COVID-19 DNA in wastewater um, days before sort of clinical outbreaks were reported and that was consistent across many cities all over the globe. So it really can be a great tool for monitoring diseases of animals and humans. Obviously there are benefits and limitations to environmental DNA. Um, some of the benefits, obviously, it can greatly improve ecosystem health monitoring and species biodiversity monitoring. Um, and it's great for sort of getting um, the whole picture of an ecosystem in terms of species composition compared to traditional methods. But obviously, there are some limitations. Um, it can't give you sort of population uh, uh, estimations or anything like that. Um, and there are sort of uh, imperfect detections that can occur. 
So we move on to the case study um, that I'm going to talk to you about today. So this is focusing on the Avonbach, which is a small tributary of the Cluid. Um, and you can see the Avonbach catchment is in the red box on both maps. So in 2009, the WFD framework um, assessment actually gave the Avonbach a poor score, which would be an orange colour. Uh, it was upgraded to moderate in 2015, and then in 2021, it dropped down to bad, which is the worst classification it can get. <coughs> so if you look as well, it's a nice comparison. So between 2015 and 2021, you can sort of see the Cluid catchment just outside of this yellow square. Um, in 2015, the catchment was looking quite good. It was either good or moderate. Um, but then in 2021, you can see there's a lot of um, degradation that's occurred um, or decline. And sort of the two bad water bodies in our North Wales catchment are on the Cluid as well. So the driving element for um, failure or giving this bad status for the Avonbach is for fish. Um, and the particular species that they're failing for are eels, bullhead and trout. Um, and it's also reported uh, high for ammonia and phosphorus as well. So, as with many catchments across all of Wales and the entire country, there are a plethora of threats um, and pollution sources. And luckily, the Avonbark suffers from all of the above. <laughs> um, so, it suffers, the primary land use is agriculture, so it suffers a lot from poaching um, and interaction with livestock. Um, it runs partly under the A55, so it gets a lot of road runoff. And low in the catchment, there is a wastewater treatment works as well. So it's a nice triple whammy. But on the flip side, and a sort of more positive note, um, with myself, obviously our organisation and a lot of other organisations as well, have done a lot of work on the oven bark to improve the, the ecosystem. So we have worked with, our trust has worked with over 20 farms on the oven bark. We've fenced off uh, four kilometres of the river. Um, removing livestock, over 500 sheep and cattle, with a minimum of a two metre buffer zone, because that allows the riparian zone to regenerate and uh, reduces sort of sediment loss and uh, erosion and things like that. Um, and then we've also planted 200 endemic trees in, in this catchment, with many more plans to come to improve this tributary, including tackling the A55 road runoff as well. So if we look at this, the two graphs. So this is the available uh, electrofishing data that NRW has collected. Um, the right graph is a bit hard to see, but that's just um, separated into individual species. But if you want to look at the right graph, uh, the left graph, sorry. So this is between 2007 and 2017. And this is just each sampling point is just the number of species detected during the electrofishing um, survey periods. The uh, bar in the middle, which is a different colour, is a slight outlier because it's taken from a slightly different location. Um, but you can see, so the, the bar on the left up to the yellow bar is from 2007 to 2011. And you can see between four and six species um, were detected during the electrofishing surveys on the Avon Bar. And then the two bars on the right are uh, 2015 and 2017. And you can see that only two species of fish were detected during those surveys. So, yeah, quite a decline in, in those surveys. So, because it's a, a quite a degraded uh, habitat, and because of the decline in species detection during the electrofishing surveys, we wanted to focus some of our baseline environmental DNA analysis on this catchment to really see what actual species are present. So, just to sort of give you a bit of... Uh, um, orientation. So the red line is the Avonbach, the blue star is where the local wastewater treatment works is located, and the orange fish is where we took our eDNA sample, um, which is the same location as the NRW electrofishing survey um, site. Um, and I'll just briefly glaze over this. Um, so this is sort of a very simplified method for eDNA analysis. So you would collect your sample from whatever environment that you're wanting to look at, and in our case, the oven bark, which is a tributary of the Cluid. And you can analyse the eDNA in a couple of ways. So you can either do it through a more digitised method, which is sort of what my area of expertise, or more of a lab-based method. But ultimately, you can get the sort of same or similar outcome, um, which can be either sort of community assemblages, so the entire sort of species composition of those sites. It can help with biodiversity surveys, impact assessments, 
Um, it can help, obviously, detect invasive, rare, or new species. Um, it's great for pet pathogen detection as well and for helping out uh, understand food webs. So this is what we found. So this table here is, um, so we've got all the species on the left. So we analyzed all the vertebrate DNA present in our eDNA sample. Um, the second column is the number of reads. So that's the amount of DNA, DNA fragments present in that sample. And then you've got the IUCN red list uh, classification and whether the species is invasive or not. So if, we, if I go back to so the 2015-2017 um, electrofishing for fish only found two uh, species in each of those sampling times. But from our one non-invasive um, environmental sample collection, we were able to detect six species of fish. So the Eurasian minnow, brown trout were even in there, which was really surprising. Uh, the three-spined stickleback, European bullhead, uh, the critically endangered European eel, which was good to see, um, and the stone loach. And we were also able to detect uh, four species of bird, which interacted with the watercourse, uh, one amphibian species, and four species of mammal, obviously two invasives, the brown uh, rat and the grey squirrel. Um, so just to mention, so just to highlight that this isn't a sort of indication that the watercourse has improved at all. Um, we've done a lot of work in the last year, but we won't see those benefits for a long while to come. Um, but this sort of just highlights more the sensitivity of, uh, at species detection of this method. So yeah, so what does that mean for um, whales and sort of the uh, applicability of eDNA across rivers in Wales? So it's a highly sensitive tool that's able to detect endangered, elusive and invasive species um, with the potential to discern entire sort of species compositions from a single sample. It's a great tool for monitoring both human and wildlife pathogens uh, with an early warning sign. Um, being, it can be an early warning sign for disease outbreaks. The benefit of rivers is that everything flows in one direction, as I mentioned earlier. So it could really be a great way to target particular areas of interest. Um, and it's also especially applicable to those hard to reach areas as well. Uh, environmental DNA is a powerful tool. And I know I'm very biased um, because that's what I do. Um, but it's a really powerful tool that can be incorporated into biodiversity assessments and coupled with traditional methods um, and environmental monitoring, it could be a a really good sort of addition to bolster uh, management and conservation practices. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'll answer any questions I think after the break. Yeah.